Hello everyone, uh, my name is Abigail and on behalf of the organisers Oliver Kinross I'd like to welcome you all to London Build Online. I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our sponsors but with special mention of our sponsor of today's session, Johnson Mappy, whose retrofit emission control activities are represented in the UK by their UK agent BISAF. Today's session will kickstart with a short presentation followed by a panel discussion on cleaner air, cleaner cities and cleaner construction, moderated by Dr Richard O'Sullivan and joined by our fantastic lineup of panellists. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A throughout the session, so do take the opportunity to submit any questions you have in the questions box on your screen. I hope you all enjoy today's webinar and I'd like to hand over to you now, Dr O'Sullivan. Welcome to this London Build webinar sponsored by Johnson Mathy. Johnson Mathy is over 200 years old, and for all of that time, we've had a strong association with London. So we're very happy to be engaged with this webinar today with London Build. Johnson Mathy is a FTSE 100 company and is a recognised leader in the science of making the world a cleaner and better place. Science is at the core of what we do creating solutions to meet customer needs and tackling some of the world's greatest problems. Today, there is much discussion about the need to build back better. And we have a great opportunity to deploy technology that enables cleaner and greener construction in London and in cities around the world. In the next 90 minutes, we have a great lineup of experts who will share their experience with you and it is an indication of what Johnson Matthey has achieved that in the time of this webinar, Johnson Matthey products will have removed 4,000 tonnes of pollution from combustion processes before they enter the atmosphere. We will share with you why we do this and how we achieve this. It is an interactive process and we want to engage with you and work with you so that we can make cities cleaner and greener and better places to live and work. I hope you enjoy this webinar and find it useful. Good morning. My name is Richard O'Sullivan. I'm the technical director of BISAF. I'm going to be talking about the dangers of diesel particulate and the role of the low emission zone, London low emission zone in controlling that and where diesel particulate filters come in. So first of all, um, you know, what is diesel particulate matter? You can see on, on the uh, schematic here, uh, a single human hair and some fine grains of beach sand. And then the blue spheres going across the width of the human hair are the coarse end of diesel particulate and superimposed onto one of those spheres. There are some red uh, spheres and a number of those fit across uh, the width of, of each coarse particulate. And that's the fine end, the PM 2.5 uh, of, of diesel particulate. And the reason that this is important is that the body, the human body hasn't developed uh, the protection, uh, the defense mechanisms against these very fine particles. And so they can be breathed deep into our lungs and there they go into the bloodstream and all around the body. Now, these diesel particles are composed mostly of carbon, but uh, coated onto them, there are some carcinogenic hydrocarbons. And a few years ago, the World Health Organization designated diesel particulate as carcinogenic to humans and increasing the risk of lung cancer. Um, it's also re responsible <clears throat> or, or linked with various other serious uh, health conditions, um, various heart and, and lung conditions, uh, bladder cancer, and, and even dementia. Uh, so it's a very bad thing for, for human health. In the short term, uh, if you're exposed to higher levels of diesel particulate, it can make you feel sick, it can irritate your airways and cause coughing, and also dizziness. So 
definitely not a, a good thing. Now, looking at the impact that this has on on health um, in London alone thousands of people uh, die prematurely each year due to the effects of diesel particulate um, in the UK as a whole this comes up to tens of thousands and just to put it into context you know we're talking about similar sorts of numbers to those that have died prematurely through the effects of coronavirus this year and the the deaths due to diesel particulate have been going on for for decades it's also more likely to affect vulnerable groups such as the the young and the old and also the sick and it's been shown that you're more likely to die of coronavirus or covid19 if you live in a highly polluted area than uh, if you have the benefit of clean air. Looking, focusing down now at construction in particular, it's estimated that hundreds of uh, ex-construction workers die each year due to lung cancer caused by their exposure to diesel particulate through their jobs. And, it, <clears throat> and in the UK, um, diesel exhaust is covered by the COSH regulations and health and safety guidance, executive guidance, and employers of course have a legal duty to um, protect their workers from harm, and this includes the effects of, of diesel particulate. And although we'll discuss in and we'll talk about the Johnson Matthey diesel particulate filters, just a quick mention or the BISAF particulator, which was um, developed a, a diesel particulate filter that is convenient and easy to use for smaller machines <clears throat> that tend to be um, dirtier in, in, in their exhausts um, and also more likely to be used in confined spaces that represent a health, uh, a, an occupational health issue. So now looking um, at the technology of the diesel particulate filter. The diesel particulate filter is the technological solution for um, controlling diesel particulate in exhaust. And you can see in the schematic that you have um, a structure that's composed of, of tiny squared off tubes that run the length of the filter. And at the inlet end, alternate cells are blocked off. And at the outlet end, the opposite cells are blocked off. And so the exhaust shown here with the purple and the blue arrows has to flow through the wall of the filter. And this is a porous ceramic structure and it very effectively removes the particulate from exhaust. And on the right, there are a couple of um, filters shown in, in a photograph to give you some idea of what they actually look like. Then how, how effective actually are these filters? Well, we carried out some work at an independent um, automotive emissions research facility called Cambustion, and we measured the level of diesel particulate in a, an, an exhaust from a small excavator, and we ran the machine over a cycle and uh, the graph on, on the right, the black line shows how that particulate builds up over time. Then we fitted the filter and measured the concentration of particulate in the exhaust after the filter. And that's shown in the green line, which hugs the baseline. So there's almost no particulate being emitted uh, from the filter. And actually the difference between the black line and the green line is um, uh, shows a 99.98% reduction in particulate over the filter. So these things are highly effective. Now to look at the London uh, low emission zone for non-road machines and particularly construction machines. So London has a, a continuing problem with air quality. It doesn't meet its targets. The air is still too dirty in London. And as the emissions from 
other sources, so uh, other vehicles such as trucks and, and cars has come down due to improving technology and low emission zones for, for those vehicles. Construction, the amount of pollution from construction has gone up um, in, in proportion. And so construction machinery now accounts for 15% of fine particulate emissions in London. So that's led to the mayor imposing uh, restrictions on construction machines in a similar way to um, those that have been applied for trucks and cars. And I'll read you one sentence from the regulations that, that sums up the restrictions. So the current standards are stage four for construction machinery operating in the central activity zone and opportunity areas including Canary Wharf and stage 3b in the rest of London. Now, one of the ways of meeting these regulations is to fit, a retrofit a filter to um, a stage 3A uh, machine, for example, to bring it up to stage 3B. And my colleague, Peter Vert uh, from Johnson Matty, who's the manager of the retrofit emissions business for construction machinery, will talk more about those systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Wirt. I'm the product manager for Diesel Particulate Filter at Johnson Matty. On the following slides, I will show you our EPF technology we are offering. Johnson Matty offers a large range of diesel particulate filters built in stainless steel housing. And uh, these filters have a particle reduction up to 99% measured by particle count. A critical aspect of this filter performance is its regeneration. Johnson Matty offers two types of regeneration strategies, the passive regeneration, which doesn't need any external assistance or energy, is suitable for engines which have temperature above 220 degrees C, such as excavators, reloaders, compressors, and generators. Secondly, we offer active regeneration, which does need external fuel or electrical energy for regeneration. This is suitable for applications which have lower exhaust gas temperature below 220 degrees C, such as grains, forklift trucks, and machines with low operating hours. For the passive DPF systems, Johnson Matty offers three types of particulate filters, which are the DPF CSF, a coded suit filter, the DPF CRT, the continuously regeneration trap, and the combination out of both the DPF CCRT system, which regenerates from very low 220 degrees C and above. The DPF CCRT is the most reliable passive DPF system on the market. Here you can see a case study with a passive system installed on a Hitachi excavator with uh, 310 kilowatts. DPF system is a DPF CCRT 2012 in parallel, operates for over 1,200 hours. This slide shows some examples about other passive DPF solutions. You see locomotives, generators, excavators, concrete pumps, quarry excavators, and dumpers, tractors, and mini excavators, and so on. For the active regeneration, Johnson Matty offers two types of particulate filter systems. The DPFI, the elect with electrical heating, this needs external power, external electrical power. The DPFBU system is a burner system who, knew, who uses diesel fuel from the machine. The DPFBU is the most convenient and reliable active DPF system. In this slide, slide you can see a case study for active regeneration. It is a Copelco crawler grain with 247 kilowatts. The system installed is a DPFBU 2013 and it runs or operates for over 1,700 hours. Other applications, active applications are crawler grains, forklift trucks, mobile grains, 
and so on. All systems are equipped with a diagnostic system, a PO CAN system, which has a data logger in and a protocol file for service and a graphic display, which shows the status messages for operator and service personnel. All systems, including the filter monitor, are certified by EST, the Energy Serving Trust for London, and also by word for other countries. In summary, the technology we are offering, we are market leader in supply of retrofit DPF systems for non-road mobile machinery in Europe. We have a commercial operation for over 28 years with thousands of DPFs in field. We offer a wide range of passive and active systems for engine power from above one kilowatt up to over 1000 kilowatts. A diagnostic system is supplied with each of these systems and they are all certified by EST and WORD. Generally, they can be easily adapted to any application. Thank you for, it, for your attention. Next, you will see a short video with a case study. Today, we are in Bamnathol's Allbrook Depot in Eastleigh, and I want to give you an introduction and an overview of how we retrofit one of their crawler cranes with a Johnson Mathe DPF BU system. Because the crane is a, a, an age where the tear rating is not, not suited for working in London now because of the emissions. So we approached you uh, to make our crane available to work in London. Fitting a DPF system begins with a site survey, where we visit the machine and inspect the engine room, the driver's cab and everything in between. Johnson Mathy then specify the DPF system that best suits the equipment. BISAF always follow a clearly defined process. Our first step is to remove the original exhaust system, which we then take back to our workshop. Johnson Mathy's retrofit kits have a myriad of components. We clone a lot of the original components so that the DPF system slots into the place of the original exhaust. Back on site, the team begins to rebuild the exhaust system. The Corderite wall flow filter, with more than 99.8% reduction rate, is at the heart of the installation. Whilst the filter is the heart, Johnson Mathy's PO CAN electronic control unit is the brain of the installation. It coordinates the regeneration process, warns the operator when regeneration becomes necessary, and flags up potential faults. Fault analysis and system intervention can be done from anywhere with BISAF's telematic control system. Cranes need active regeneration systems with burner units. The team thoroughly checks every step of the process and there is quality control at every stage. Once installation is complete and after a test run, a comprehensive handover takes place. Handing over the Energy Savings Trust Certificate marks the start of our after-sales service. People like the older machines, you know, that's what, that's what gets me is they like the older machines. Um, it's just making them, bring them up to a better, cleaner standard. But to me, I think it's good, you know, anything to make the world a better, cleaner place. Yeah, as Bam Nuttall was one of the leading civil engineers in the UK, um, it's important that we look at emissions uh, from our machines. And one of the machines was the crawler crane, which we had a job with Thames Tideway which would come under the emissions of London. So the exhaust system we wanted to fit would reduce our diesel particulate that we're emitted to the air, and this system helps us achieve that. Uh, I spoke to a couple of my colleagues that run cranes, and um, BICEF was mentioned to me as a, as a good option. Conversations we have were good and positive, um, do, do, good dialogue and quality of product, so we decided to go with BICEF that have delivered in a quality profession. 
Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope that you found it interesting and informative. Please get in touch with us if we can be of any further help if you need any information. Thank you so much. We'll now be moving on to the panel discussion. Right. Good, good morning, everybody. I, I hope that you found uh, the presentation interesting. Um, we're going to have a discussion now um, with our uh, panel of, of experts. And um, perhaps, first of all, just to, to kick things off, Peter, we, we focus very much on the UK market for retrofit filters, uh, but John Samati has been very active in, in other markets around Europe and perhaps you could just talk briefly about some of those and, and the, um, the restrictions they have, the regulations that they have uh, leading to the retrofit diesel particulate filters on construction machinery and you know, just the, the experience of users in those markets. Hello, my name is Peter Liet. I'm the product manager for diesel particulate filter for retrofit at Johnson Matty. We do, uh, since uh, over 15 years, uh, particulate filter installation in Switzerland, where all of this uh, construction machinery above 18 kilowatts must have DPF on. This is still ongoing, also with machines with uh, stage four, which do have only uh, SCR on. It needs to retrofit a DPF that uh, they can use it on their construction places over there. In Germany, for example, we have some regulations for close areas where you have to use a particulate filter if you operate a diesel engine. And also the German railway, the Deutsche Bahn, requires a diesel particulate filter for machines, uh, for construction machines, also for subcontractors who wants to do any work for the Deutsche Bahn. As well, we have uh, some areas like in Berlin where we have some schemes to retrofit diesel particulate filter for construction machinery and also area around, uh, around Stuttgart. This is uh, the city of uh, Tübingen and others. They require uh, diesel particulate filter for construction machinery or stage five or stage four machinery. This is uh, the main areas where we are working on here in this case. We had also done uh, a lot in the Netherlands, in Dutch, and also we supply our systems to Norway or Sweden or Denmark, where they have also some local schemes or uh, low emission zones in the cities where it is a need for this particulate filter on the construction machinery. This is a short overview of what we are doing in other countries besides uh, London or UK. And, and Peter, what, what has been the experience in those markets of fitting uh, retrofit diesel particulate filters? Yes, uh, we have a good, very good feedback. In the beginning, all of the operators uh, were against this particulate filter for any reason, but today it is so they, they don't want to miss it anymore. They like that they do not have black noses in, in the evening when they go home from work, for example because the working place is uh, often very small. Many machinery diesel engines are operating over there and the suit is uh, all over around. And since they use diesel particulate filter, then the machines are clean, the air is cleaner, and also they uh, have a better health when they are coming home. So it is very well accepted to use diesel particulate filter and also the operators would not use machines without Thank you, Peter. Um, perhaps I, I could uh, just ask Damien uh, a question on his experience of people uh, using 
retrofit filters to meet the regulations in in London. And uh, the I guess the feeling in the construction industry on on the regulations themselves. Um, whether you have any views on that, Damien? Well, the industry is, is, is definitely been changing, and um, as a construction equipment supplier, we, we've been finding that customers are, are more vocal about um, how clean and green the machines are. Um, so obviously, we've been working with BISAP for, for, for a few years now on trying to reduce our green impact. But it's not just about, you know, we, we, we look at London as a whole, but Londons and towns um, are getting more congested. And so it's, it's, it's very much about the welfare of, of the, uh, the, the people on the sites, um, but also the closer community as well, because most sites nowadays would supply, um, you know, for us as a company, we would supply multiple pieces of equipment um, to sites and um, you know they're, they're ranging in size to, to heavy machinery to obviously the smaller greener machines but um, we're, we're finding now that the um, the requirement is becoming um, it, it's it's a daily requirement as, as you know a year 18 months ago it would be a weekly requirement so the, the the impact is is certainly we're feeling the impact on on customers and clients alike wanting greener machines. So um, yeah, we're also you know we're we're in the process of of renewing the fleet to stage five. So that brings it down again. Um, but we're we're still using um, regeneration systems even on stage five engines to to, to make them even greener. So. Thank you for that, Damien. Um, we've got a, a question uh, that uh, that Peter can perhaps answer, uh, yeah. and, and it's asking how long does it take between um, wanting a filter and actually getting it fitted to the machine so that it's ready to go again? Since it is ordered and uh, we deliver it, uh, I, think I would say in between uh, two weeks to, to the customer side. And I guess uh, another two to three days is a normal uh, installation work, uh, which can, uh, can be done in this time. So at least it is a uh, maximum three weeks. And then I, I would add to that, uh, it, it takes about a week to actually install the the system uh, you saw the video um you know before anything is ordered we need to assess the machine for for the type of filter that's most suitable uh and once we have once bisaf have the filter from johnson matty we need to go on site um remove bits of the original exhaust system and uh, take them back to the workshop uh, modify the the filter so that it can fit nicely onto the the machine then uh, take it all back again install everything and, and test it so i guess from the beginning of the process to to the end uh i we're, we're talking about you know four to five weeks um minimum to actually you know between deciding you you want a filter to actually upgrading the machine with the filter so it's ready to work again. And perhaps I, I can ask a, a question to, um, to Mark. Clearly, you know, over the years, health and safety on site has become a bigger issue and companies are more focused on their um, health and safety requirements for the employees. Uh, although the London low emission zone and the requirement for to, to meet that on construction machinery is more about the general population's health, um, 
can you say something about the the impact of of diesel exhaust and coming from machines on site and the 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 sort of considerations that uh contractors are making now to reduce exposure to uh, their employees yes thanks for that richard um so um with health health and safety uh, from that in aspect of it um i suppose the big difference really is if we have a safety incident there is pretty much a very instant result and it's seen by everybody and and everybody relaxes to it or um but it, when we're talking health issues um we're talking about exposure over a period of time and latent conditions that can come out months years down the line uh, so it's not as easy to see what the issue is straight away because it's coming out a long time after the people have not you know maybe not even working in the industry anymore and there's some um, some pretty big and worrying statistics um if you were to take a you know a, a broad survey of say 100 people the amount of safety um instance broken bones legs that sort of stuff the instant stuff that we're talking about would only equate equate to one of those people there's a whole 99 other cases of long-term and short-term health effects and obviously exposure to diesel particulates do come into that now with um the introduction of the um, NERM and the uh, low emission zone in london um it's definitely been a, an education uh, and a learning process and i'm sure damien would back me up on that in the first um when it first started going about um you would see um i think it's damien said you know you might get a couple of inquiries in a week now it's a daily basis and, and obviously as the different standards have been introduced and it's the audits are taking place there's definitely been a drive to increase the knowledge base um, of all of our contractors. We're a managing contractor at Waits and um, we rely on our supply chain uh, and we have to spend a lot of time informing them about it. But, you know, it's no longer as much of a uh, conversation anymore. It's part of our planning process to ensure any plant and machinery that they're bringing onto site are compliant. You know, we do basement work, we do um, uh, work in uh, cut and carve, all places where smaller types of machinery, not necessarily covered by NERM in its current form, are still um, pushing out diesel, diesel particles, you know, the so-called smaller dirty machines. And um, the product you were talking about earlier does help, help us in our method of controlling those um, emissions and exposures that we need to control under the um under the cost regs thank you mark uh, thanks for that answer um, i'd also like to um, bring in michael cully um, from john sisk and um, michael have, have you got anything to add to that uh, from your experience uh, in health and safety on site and uh, the the effect of diesel exhaust on on people's health and the concerns there hi richard matthew here michael's just having some technical issues getting logged on to the session so we're just in contact with him now so if you'd like to to carry on i'll keep you updated <laughs> okay thank you um i'll i'll come back to peter then if if i can and um some of the regulations in London are or the newer regulations that have actually been postponed until February because of the um, pandemic and, and, and the issues around that are, are more for um, NOx control than diesel particulate. And so to meet stage four, for example, you need, uh, if, if you had stage 3a machine you wanted to upgrade to stage four you would need need both particulate and nox uh, retrofit control can you 
talk a bit about the, the technology for improving NOx emissions from machines. Yes, we have the retrofit uh, SCR systems. SCR is uh, for is using a catalyst and a reduction liquid called Air Glue to reduce uh, NOx coming from the engine tailpipe. And we can reduce it depending on uh, the injection rate up to maybe 80, 90 percent, whatever is needed. This is a system which will uh, install uh, downstream the DPF system. Needs a little bit more space than a, a particular filter alone. That means we have to look that we could find a good solution for uh, to build it on or to install it on a machine. We need also some uh, little bit air supply. A small compressor will be needed to blow the injection uh, this uh, head glue into this uh, into the uh, injection grid to get a good spray and develop uh, this urea to ammonia, which we need for the reduction of the NOx. This system uh, will be use uh, ECU for controlling. That means we have access to the CAN bus where we can see or we can measure then, uh, what is the, the load, engine load and temperature that we can uh, use the right injection rate from a table in the ECU to inject the right value, not to over inject with the system and get a, a leakage out of this. The systems we have uh, installed, for example, in German salt mines for some years for big production loaders to reduce uh, both DPFs and uh, also NOx to these machines. As I said, uh, both together needs a little bit more space to, for the installation on the machine. But uh, if we have a good design, then uh, this is not uh, a big problem. And, uh, it works without any adjustment to the operator. It is uh, starting up when the machine will be started and we inject uh, this uh, at blue at a temperature, exhaust gas temperature above 230 degrees and above. And uh, monitor everything by NOx uh, sensors to see if there's any failure or if everything is okay. That means we have some display which uh, indicates the operator that uh, he can go on or he can stop if there is any uh, failure with the injection grid, for example. We have uh, these systems that we can adjust to mainly all uh, diesel engines, very small up to very big machines. We have, uh, or John Zmetti has a lot of experience also with uh, uh, machines, uh, generator machines with over 1,000 uh, kilowatts engine power. And uh, here in this case, uh, we speak about, I would say, 18 kilowatts up to 500 kilowatts, where it will be possible to install such a system. Okay, thank you for that answer, Peter. Uh, you know, just a comment of my own um, that in a retrofit SDR system is relatively more complicated than a diesel particulate filter to retrofit because um, the diesel particulate filter takes all of the exhaust and filters out pretty much all of the particulate and the uh, technical issue is more around how you regenerate the diesel particulate filter, how you remove the trapped soot from the system. With an SCR, you have to inject exactly the right amount of urea into the uh, before the SCR catalyst, and that determining how much urea or add blue to inject is is quite a, a, a tricky thing, and you need um, inputs from various sensors to calculate that. Um, you know, each time the exhaust composition changes. Uh, John Samati do have these systems, but they haven't been widely required around the rest of Europe as diesel particulate filters. And uh, there are certification processes that need to be carried out uh, to comply with the Energy Saving Trust rules so that they can be uh, used in the London scheme. 
and uh, John Samati is in the process of um, going through that certification process. Um, so, yeah, j just just to add that. Um, we we also uh, need to perhaps look at the reliability of filters in the field and and I'd perhaps ask uh, Damien um, or, or Mark or, or Michael whether they have any experience of, of any retrofit filters uh, that have been fitted to machines that they're aware of and uh, whether they've been reliable or not? Well, yeah, we, we obviously we currently run um, the biosmith system, and um, we've currently got them on excavator, small excavators, um, and skid steer loaders in confined spaces. And um, the feedback from the, from the customers uh, and clients alike is very good. Um, we're also entering a slightly different stage um, where the system concerned because we are looking at doubling up the system for clients requirements um, because they're looking to use um, bigger machines so for instance we've recently done a telehandler um, which is a 55 kilowatt engine 74 horsepower um, and by doubling up the, the um, systems um, we're, we're enabling the customer to have a, a greener telehandle let's say um, on a site where they that isn't available now I, I know there is a um, a few electric small telehandlers coming out but we're enabling the customer to, to go that little bit further by um, doubling up the system and um, giving them a slightly bigger machine um, Again, we, we're, we're entering a, a stage where we're putting on slightly bigger access platforms um, because uh, we're either working in close confinement in a small site, a, a bit like Mark said, you know, requirements might be a basement or a, um, a portal building that someone's building, or it could be a, um, a large studio that someone's working in. Um, so we're constantly sort of moving. Um, the goalpost to, to, to suit the site, but the, um, the feedback that we've been given from customers and clients alike has been um, it's been very good, it's been encouraging for us. Um, it's encouraging for us, but which it allow, also allows us to invest more and, and, and move the product forward. I suppose I can just really um, echo Damien's uh, comments there. In, in, in generally, um, as I said earlier, we don't generally hire equipment ourselves but you know we will have our, our our contractors come on with their pieces of planting equipment and and they're there for a finite period of time so our experience i i don't recall any having failed or having to have any um action to come out to to put it right and and during the audits that we have had nothing has been identified to to not be working as it should have been so I can only speak for from my opinion, but the opinion is good um, from from what we've seen and, and our experience today. We do, um, as, as Damien was talking about, access equipment. Um, we do use some of the hybrid stuff that is out there um, when we are inside, should we say, schools or um, as a good example, large spaces. Um, so you know, we do mix and match, and we do find that um, clients are much more educated. Um, around this process and um, are actually asking us how we how they can help us to um, to achieve a, a greener more effective output um, through the carbon emissions and everything else that we have to do including you know the the, the um, effect on people's health through the uh, life of the construction part of that project so you know we are seeing um, it definitely coming from the client direction as well I think the first people that would complain would be the the operators or the the, the workforce working in in the closed confinement around this machine. As soon as, as as they feel uncomfortable around it, we would know, and that hasn't happened 
to date. So that's why we're confident in what we're doing at the moment. Good. Th thank you, everybody, for that. We we have um, some questions from the audience uh, that have, have uh, been coming through, and uh, I should look at at, at those. Um, there's there's one here about the AdBlue system, so the SCR system and the particulate filter, uh, and it's whether one sort of supersedes the other. If 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 you have one, do you still need the other one? And I I would answer that with uh, yes, you do, uh, because if you're trying to control particulate and NOx. Uh, the diesel particulate filter obviously controls the the particulate level and doesn't have any real effect on, on NOx. And um, the opposite is true for the SCR system; it doesn't really affect the amount of diesel particulate you get uh, emitted from the exhaust. But of course, it does target NOx. And so, if you're trying to get both, un unfortunately, you need a, a diesel particulate filter and uh, an SCR system. Um, there's a, a que question about disposable filters uh, and their role in, in uh, as diesel particulate filters. And perhaps I could ask you, Peter, to say a word about disposable filters. Yes, uh, we do not offer disposable filters. We use uh, regenerate, regeneratable filters. This makes more sense. And uh, for disposable filters, the problem is often that they have a, a limited uh, exhaust gas temperature, maybe 250, 300 degrees C or something. So uh, it could be that the engine is running with very low temperature, but it would be able to reach higher temperature, whereas this filter can burn through without any control. So we lean on uh, this, uh, on our filter systems, which we offer, where we can regenerate them external or internal by electrical systems or with the burner system or with catalytic systems. So we are not offering these systems because they make maybe too many problems then. And if, if I could just add to Peter's response, um, disposable filters are generally not as efficient as uh, these permanent filters. The permanent filters that we're offering are the same technology as original equipment and they have this very high you know 99 percent plus removal of particulate whereas a disposable filter is going to be you know quite a bit lower th than that and so you will always get some particulate being emitted even with a disposable filter and it does rely on the operator to change it at a regular basis otherwise you'll get problems you'll get higher particulate emissions or the filter being destroyed or the machine not operating effectively because the back pressure becomes too high and all of these things make disposable filters much less effective than uh, the the permanent um, John Samathy filters that uh, we're talking about um there's uh, uh, so, sorry would anybody Richard, like can i just that? jump in yeah hi it's michael cully from um cisc sorry yeah. about the connection problem i'm in northern sweden at the moment um in i suffer from asthma and in 29 march 2019 i was on a construction site in london and i took a bad asthma attack while out inside I got that bad, an ambulance was called, and I nearly died. I was taken to St. Thomas's Hospital and I spent two days in intensive care. One of the contributing factors was poor air quality that caused this problem for me. And it's something that I'm really passionate about. And it's something I've been driving on my projects with this wonderful discussion you've been having up to now about the filters and the equipment that we, um, have on construction sites and some of the fantastic work that's been done but I, as somebody who's i can walk into an area now and 
I can feel it on my lungs uh, sometimes, and you can tell the person, why well, has that machine been fed with a scrubber or a filter? And um, you know, but it people like me who who have been bothered by um, poor pollution, it is extremely. Um, it, it, I'm being involved in safety. Now, I don't know if you're aware of the in, um, the article in the Guardian yesterday where the young girl died from poor air quality and um, the coroner had a go at the council saying this should have been uh, an emergency, uh, pollution emergency in the area. But I'm, this is coming from first-hand experience with me and it's just something I wanted to share with you because it's, it's something, like I said, I'm really passionate about. Yes, Th thank you very much for that, Michael. And you now that, that's a very powerful reminder that you know, we're not talking about a, a theoretical set of regulations that need to be met. It does have very real consequences, air pollution. And as, as I said earlier in, in the presentation, it does affect the people who are sick, um, who have illness, underlying illnesses, um, the people that, that are older and, and young people. And yes, I did read about the uh, girl who died, um, I think now back in 2013, uh, and the, you know, her death is, is being strongly linked to living beside the busy South Circular Road and the effects of air pollution on, on her health. So yeah, it's it's not um, you know, purely meeting regulations that's driving this. At, at the end of the day, it's um, people's health. And you know, one of the things that that currently um, is is you know we we're, we've all lived through the coronavirus or living through the coronavirus pandemic and people being ill. But it's shown that um, it's been shown that those you're more likely to be severely affected with COVID-19 if you live in a highly polluted area and your illness is likely to be worse if you also have high pollution in the background. Uh, and in fact, you're more likely to die uh, if, if you have high pollution as well. So, yeah, it, it isn't. Um, a, a theoretical set of, of regulations, you know, another hurdle to get over. It does actually have benefits to people's health, um, fitting these filters and, and reducing the pollution. Um, not least, of course, the the workers, the construction workers on site, um, as, as well as the general population. Um, I, I don't know, um, Mark, do you have anything to, to add to that? And Michael's experience. Um, I, I suppose it kind of goes back to my my point earlier, um, which is around you know this is this is something invisible that you can't see, and unless you have the experience that um, Michael has had, where you know unfortunately, you know it seriously affected him. Not everybody is maybe that um, tuned into it, so you know it goes back to this education process talking about it getting it out there and, and ensuring from you know from the project team's point of view when they're looking at how we're planning these tasks that it's absolutely front and center of what we're considering you know as i've said people who injure themselves you see it there and then but you don't see what the latent issues are that are starting to affect them and obviously in the um instance of this young girl there was obviously an exposure over a period of time that has, has come to this unfortunate situation. And from all occupational health points of views, this this not seeing a direct result of something on site, people, unless they're aware of it, that don't see the connections and don't actually understand that they are being exposed to whatever it might be. And in this case, we're talking diesel particulate. Um, it, it's a silent killer. Potentially, um, I, I don't know if you want to add a little bit more to that, Michael. Really? Yeah, I, I agree. And um, I'm now in northern Sweden, 
and where I am, it's it, there's not a lot of people here. It's about a hundred thousand people. I've been here since August, and I have used my inhaler. I can count on one hand the amount of times I've used the inhaler. Uh, I can feel the difference in the quality of the air up here. The air is much quali uh, it's much clearer, and um, I'm I'm a lot fitter. I feel a lot better. I'm back in London on Friday, and I can tell you when I get back into London. Um, my medication use will go up. So if you, there's the proof if you want to. Uh, there is a problem there, and all you got to do is just go into central London yourself, and you'll see. Yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting point point you make there, and um, it, it triggered something in my mind. Before um, I was in construction, I was in um, I was in the army for 23 years, and. Um, I was fortunate to go to lots of places around the world. Some, some nice, not some not so nice. But one of the places I went to was um, South Georgia. I was based on South Georgia for a tour. And, and and what Michael is saying there is absolutely true. The air that you were breathing on South Georgia, where there just was no pollution, it was almost tasted sweet. It was you were breathing in. It tasted nice, but when we came back into um, back to the UK or back to Germany, I think it was in that case, the air was absolutely tasted horrible. The trouble is that experience disappears very quickly, and some people have never had the experience of breathing clean air, so they don't know what the difference is. But your your point is right. You will notice it when you come back, but a lot of people have never ever experienced what clean air is. And, and that's wrong, really. Thank, thank you both for that. Um, I have a question about new equipment and whether that is fitted with diesel particulate filters. And uh, you know, just to answer that myself, um, yes, uh, all all cars, all diesel cars, and all diesel heavy goods vehicles, so trucks and buses, will be fitted with um, diesel particulate filters and, and um, you know, probably some form of NOx control, SCR, certainly on the heavy goods vehicles, to comply with the latest EU legislation. And in fact, cars have been fitted with filters for probably you know, more than 10 years. Um, the for construction machinery they, they they've been a, a little bit further behind uh, but all stage five machines above i think 19 kilowatts will have diesel particulate filters um, from new in order to control the uh, the the particulate emissions and and meet the european standards of course, stage five machines have only just started to become available, and there's a lot of existing machinery out there that it is still being used, and uh, it, you know is is still valuable um, to the the owners of of that plant um, that can be upgraded by retrofitting. Um, so I hope I hope that that answers that question. Peter, do you have anything to add on that on new machinery? Yeah, there are still also uh, new machinery with steer for final, as I mentioned before, which are not equipped with the diesel particulate filter. Only with SCR reach the EU limits. But uh, in areas like uh, I explained before, in Germany or in Switzerland, uh, they need to retrofit the DPF to uh, those machines. Yeah. So even a relatively new machine uh, will need to have a, a, a diesel particulate filter fitted in those markets with the, that specific requirement. In addition, also some mini excavator which will be supplied just now with uh, engines with the uh, stage five needs to retrofit a DPF if yes. they don't have one. Okay, so. Uh, there's another question here about um, other cities other than London. And um, London has, because London has the tends to have the worst air quality. It's the the largest city, 
um, and has uh, a lot of traffic and construction activity and airports uh, contributing to air pollution and, and also a very large population of people living and breathing uh, the air. Um, the focus has always tended to be on London, but there are other major cities in the UK and um, they are or they also have air quality issues and um, are, are likely to bring in their own regulations um, and will the question is will these regulations be similar to those in London and I, I think the, the answer to that is yes they are likely to be similar because the regulations in London have been quite successful the uh, low emission zone for heavy goods vehicles and the congestion charging uh, the restriction on the older vehicles coming into London and the non-road mobile machinery low emission zone have all been successful in reducing the, the pollution problem in London and that's you know been measured and, and monitored and, and proven to be the case so uh, I think you know it's highly likely that other cities such as Birmingham and Manchester and Glasgow that have air pollution issues are, are likely to adopt similar requirements uh, perhaps I could just uh, there's quite a bit of background noise so if if people are not speaking if they could just make sure they have their microphones switched off and then switch them on when they're about to speak, I think that would be quite um, helpful. Uh, there's a, a question about operating costs of retrofit uh, systems um, and filters and whether you need to change parts. And perhaps I could ask you, Peter, to comment on uh, retrofit and um, you know after sales servicing that, that that's required yes maybe we can answer this together with the next question what is the life ex lifetime of the retrofit system how often do we need to clean the filter i think they're both together i can answer uh, so filters are made out of uh, steam, stainless steel housing and have a ceramic inlet this ceramic inlet, uh, as soon uh, as long as it will not be destroyed by thermal or mechanically uh, uh, destruction, then it would be good for over 5,000 operating hours. The problem is uh, that uh, the filter will be filled up not only with soot, it will be also filled up with uh, dust coming from the ambient, going through the engine, and uh, oil ash. This is not burnable and needs to be uh, low out from time to time. Uh, it is difficult to say if it is 500 operating hours, 1,000 operating hours or more. Uh, therefore, we have this filter monitor, which will be installed close to the operator, so that he can see if there is any problem. That means we will get a message, and also he can see uh, the directly filter filling uh, shown in millibars. That means he see if the filter uh, filling is uh, increasing, and also during the servicing, uh, it can be analyzed if uh, the filter filling is stable or if it is increasing. And uh, then uh, a decision can be made to clean the filter, for example, with blowing out the suit into a filter bag or in a, a filter cleaning machine, for example. And uh, normally, uh, nothing must be replaced. It is only if you uh, clean the filters and you put in some new gaskets, which are not. Uh, big costs of the filter. Okay, thank you for that, Peter. And, and just to reiterate a couple of the, the points that he's raised, the, the filter filters everything from the exhaust. So um, it, it's you know, very effective at removing the diesel particulates. It will also be very effective at, at removing any dust uh, and or inorganic material that comes through the engine and so if the machine is working in a very dusty environment and the air filter is is not very effective then the filter will uh, tend to you know capture that that dust as well 
as it goes through the engine and, and into the exhaust. Um, the filters are, are not designed to be replaceable, they're designed to be permanent uh, and the regeneration system you know, which Peter talked about in the presentation is all important to, uh, you know, that's absolutely critical to the way that the filter operates and, and that's why Johnson Matthey have a different range of systems to make sure that the filter is regenerated effectively. And then you know, about once a year, I guess, there, there is a, a service requirement to um, remove the filter, blow out any ash that's accumulated, uh, and you know, check the, the gaskets and, and so on. Um, but the, the system, as Peter said, is monitored with this um, ECU, this uh, electronic brain that uh, is measuring the pressure in front of the filter and um, checking things like temperatures, for example, that, that gives information on how effectively the filter is working. So um, that, that I, I guess, um, covers, covers that. And Mark and, and Michael, um, do you have anything to add about uh, you know the di different regulations in different cities, or um, the you know newer machinery coming onto the market, um, or 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 actually working with and you know op operating uh, with diesel particulate filters, whether they're on um, new machines or whether they've been retrofitted. Just then, any comments on what, what's been said over the last couple of questions? Yeah, I've, I've been involved in a couple of um, big projects in London where we've, we have done um, big basement areas and we've had to bring in machinery into very, very confined spaces. And the newer machinery, you can definitely see the difference. There's a lot more gone into the design of the machine. Um, when it comes to the filters, and I, for one, like I was saying earlier on, I can I can tell you about air quality when you go into an area, and I can definitely tell you the difference with the newer machine compared to the older machines. Even if even a machine that's had retrofit uh, filters on them, uh, because I I've been finding you do get some leaks um, with the machine with regard to air quality, and um, it you know it's it's not perfect, but a lot of the contractors now are taking this on board and there is some very very clever pieces of equipment coming on site now yes i, I suppose i would um just echo what what michael says again we have deep basements and again at this time of the year when it's starting to get a bit cold you know um it's like filling up a bath with the emissions that can potentially come out or would have been in the old days so um it's definitely something we have to keep an eye on um, and again it's all about um, the planning in the first instance having the conversations up front to make sure that the said contractor is aware of what we require on our projects um, with regards to other cities you know it's a no-brainer it, it needs to follow around um, and whilst there's an argument to say um, why are we waiting to be told by um, councils or authorities or city um, organisations? Uh, unfortunately, um, the people are driven by what the regulations are and not necessarily what they should do, which is where we look at the more mature clients to help us um, drive these, these processes through because there is a cost with it. And whilst you can argue there shouldn't be a cost, that is the reality of the situation. Uh, I don't know really if Damien, you can add what's your experience nationwide on that, I suppose. Well, yeah, being a nationwide supplier and, and hire of equipment, um, we have an obligation as much as the, the, the main contractor will to provide the cleanest and greenest equipment for 
you know, so we're we're contributing to the to the welfare and the, the well-being of the, the staff and and people within the close proximity of the equipment. Um, I think I said before, you, you know, and 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 Michael made a, a great point about the air quality. My my mother is also asthmatic and is 70 years old and would suffer um, on a daily basis um, and lives in London. So I, I see it on a you know I wouldn't be there every day, but I would see her, you know a lot of late. Haven't seen her much at all, but I do hear that she's not doing so great on, on certain days if she has to go out and do the do a local shop. But um, going back to it, yeah, as we all have a, a moral obligation to to reduce what we do and what we're producing um, as a supplier, as a contractor, you know, as a as a general public, really, because. Um, the only way we're going to make it better is we work collectively and buy products by Johnson Mathe and Bicef around. You can't um, discount these products if we're going to if we're going to move forward. So, um, but you know we, we're a, a, a national plant hire company, and so it, it, if we can't retrofit a, a machine with with a system, then we would look at, at another greener way of an electric machine, maybe or. Um, different products that are on the market so we're striving to to change the the concept of of what it is out there but we would also um encourage as well you know we we, we talk to many clients and customers at the moment and we're always telling them about the products we can supply and how we can make it greener and as i said we've we've even converted stage five machines um, with double systems on it, it it's it, it's as green, green and clean as an electric machine um so um yeah we're um i think we're all sort of moving in the right direction that's for certain thank you damien um the, there's a question uh, that's been asked about what the operators need to do um to make sure that the filters are working properly uh, and you know how susceptible are the filters to operation operating operator error um, Peter if you could talk about that in general the operator must depending on the particular filter system for example a passive system doesn't need any operator input it works uh, continuously on the emissions coming from the engine and the filter monitor inform if there is any problem at least the uh, filter, the DPF system uh, will be close the exhaust gas line because it is installed at the end of this line. If the engine is in trouble, like an uh, injector is leaking or in an intake filter is uh, blocked and the system or the engine is uh, blowing a lot of soot, then this is uh, an error which coming from, from the engine but will be indicated by the, by the back pressure system. That means the filter monitor. The operator will get a uh, message which calls maybe a warning or alarm filter is full so he can directly read it from the display and can inform his supervisor or the service personnel uh, what he found out and uh, can uh, wait for other advisors then. Okay, thank you Peter. And um, the, there's a, a question about backup service as well you know if things do go wrong with the filter um, is there any is there anybody to call to come and uh, help sort it out and i mean i i will answer that the the answer is yes um bisaf are the john somati agent in the uk for these products and you know we we see it as our job to offer a backup service and to help uh, customers out when when things do go wrong, and we you know have expertise and we can um, come and and fix these systems and and repair them if if that's uh, ever needed. Uh, <clears throat> there's a, a question here about um, I guess related to to global warming and uh, CO2 emissions and our uh, John Samati doing anything uh, about that and again I'll, I'll try
try and address this myself. Um, you know, the, the, the exhaust after treatment products are um, designed for internal combustion engines and to uh, minimize any harm uh, in terms of local air pollutants um, that are coming from, from those internal combustion engines. And so they don't address CO2. They, they neither particularly increase it or particularly decrease CO2. Um, it's just the um, regulated air pollutants that uh, are being affected and being improved. But uh, one, one of the things that people don't know to, to uh, or isn't widely publicized is the fact that diesel particulate itself is, uh, has, has a large contribution to global warming. Uh, because the soot is black, uh, when it goes up into the air, it absorbs sunlight and warms the planet. Uh, and it, it, it's reckoned to be second only to CO2 in its uh, climate forcing um, uh, effect. Um, but then when it falls to earth, it tends to make the, the stuff that it falls on dirtier and blacker than it otherwise would be. And this is particularly important for ice. So uh, you've probably heard a bit about the polar ice cap contracting um, as a result of global warming. But part of this is also due to the ice becoming dirtier due to black particulate falling onto the surface. And that then absorbs more sunlight and heats up and melts the ice. And so for both those reasons, controlling diesel particulate is, um, you know, has a positive effect for global warming as well. Um, there's uh, there's a, a question about um, how retrofit diesel particulate filters compare with the original equipment on on new machines and how effective they are. And Peter, can you just br briefly respond to that? What Transmetti is selling also for the retrofit uh, systems is uh, a standard system. That means these filters have a very high efficiency reduction rate of particulates. And also if we have a passive system where the filter will be coded, it is a coding which is uh, very well uh, controlled. So uh, it is, is a high standard and is uh, comparable with uh, the manufacturers are selling. Yes, and just to add to what, what Peter said, John Samathy are the leading supplier of diesel particulate filters for new um, engines uh, in, in the world. And so they have a, a great deal of expertise um, about fitting systems and designing systems for new machinery and you know, pretty much the same technology um, and, you know, in, in some cases, exactly the same technology is used in their retrofit products as well. Um, and there, there's, there's a question here about the, the construction industry more generally and the, the fact that the profit margins are so tight in construction. And, you know, how, I guess, how much um, money is is available and what the trade-offs are between um, trying to make a profit and um, and keeping their their machines um, clean and um, I guess keeping people safe and I, I guess that they're um, you know in the short term at least there is often a question of the cost of of safe of health and safety, and so perhaps you know, I'd I'd ask 
um, you know, any of the panelists, you know, Mark, Michael, or Damien, if they have any comments on cost versus uh, health and safety. Well, with me, um, I don't see cost because of the job I do with, with health and safety. But I do get it, you know, for, for a company to survive, you have to make a profit. That, that's, a, that's a proven fact. But it, if you just take a step back and we look at what we're required to do by law, and that's our minimum requirements, and also look at what we've got to do, you know, the principal contractor inside, they've got to plan, manage, monitor, and coordinate the construction activity. So as part of, you, part of your planning, and I've been involved in top-down construction, where we knew we we're going to be bringing a lot of plant in, into these areas. Um, we knew the work we we're going to be doing. We knew we we're going to be having, you know, 80 to 100 wagons a day taking muck away from the site. So as part of the planning stage, probably, you know, six months a year before we even got onto the project, we were meeting with contractors and we were going through all this with them. You know, what equipment you're going to be bringing on site? What standards does this equipment um, meet? What checks are you going to be doing on it? And we went through all these all these parts and we had given the contractors enough so they could properly apply price for these jobs. And but I do know that, that there is some contractors out there and there's not a lot of them. And um, it, they do put profit first. It, it's just a fact of life that we're dealing with at the moment, but it is better. And it's very rare you come across it at the moment. But if, if this was done properly, the plan, manage, monitor and coordinate, and at the very, very start getting the planning done, um, we would be in a much better position um, than some sites are today. I suppose I'd, I'd just like to echo what Michael said there, you know, and I've mentioned it several times in some of the responses I've, I've given. It is all about the planning. This is foreseeable. We know about it now. Um, so there's no really excuse why it's not there. It has to be factored in. And um, for a company to survive, whether it's us as a, ma uh, a main contractor, principal contractor, or, or a subcontractor, or a hire company, we have to move with the times. And, 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 and this is here and it's here to stay and, until we um, make a change on the world, basically. So um, it's just what we have to do. We have to plan for it. We talk in advance. Uh, and, and then it's not a surprise when a, a contractor turns up on site and that, you know, it's not that their machines won't be compliant because we've gone through all these planning stages before we get there. And, and then that, you know, that's what my company do. That's what many principal contractors will do. But we can't say that every single contractor is doing that. And, and that's where the change needs to take place. Um, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm sure Michael will echo me on this. You know, unfortunately, the HSE do generally ignore the smaller contractors and concentrate on the major contractors. And, you know, there should be no difference. There is, there is a cost factor in, in terms of the supply. We, we, we want to provide equipment to, to the industry, which is the cleanest and greenest. Um, but as a purchaser of, of you know, hundreds of pieces of plant a year, um, the, the, the greener they get, the, the more expensive they get. And um, it's not always a case that these costs are forwarded on to the, to the, to the end user, but it, it it definitely is and will have to change because it, by making the machine greener or by buying an electric machine or by fitting a retrofit system there's a cost involved and it it, it, it has to be passed on um it, that's just the, the the way it is um we're no different to any other company in terms of supply but we want to make sure that what we do supply is compliant and um it's safe for the industry. That, thank you for that. Um, and, uh, you know, j j I guess to echo those thoughts as well, um, you know, short term savings on health and safety 
practices uh, can have you know expensive long-term consequences and so yes um, although profit margins are, are tight you know everybody uh, has a, a right to work in a safe environment and employers have a legal duty to make sure that they provide a, a safe working environment for their employees so i i guess um you know the and in terms of diesel particulate filters uh in in london it's a general re requirement as much to benefit the whole population as it is to benefit the the workers alongside the machines but it it, it does have that benefit um of, of improving working conditions for people and um and there is a, a level of, of subjectivity here because there there is no um rec there is no um concentration of diesel particulate that is um allowed or or, or disallowed on, on on a site so um you have to i think you know it, it, just looking at the occupational health and safety you need to make a risk assessment of what sort of environment you're going to be working in whether you know whether it's a confined space or digging a, a hole or working near a school or a hospital and uh, you know what what you do it, 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 is it going to affect um the people working on site and and others nearby and so apart from the low emission zone regulations i think you know more generally people should be looking at cleaner machines and um, the use of retrofit uh, emissions after treatment just to comply with, with general safety principles and practices um we've actually now come to the end uh, of this webinar it's now 12 o'clock and so uh, i'd like to thank the other panelists quickly for for their help you know for um peter from johnson matthew in germany thanks for joining us um thank, thank you mark for for your event um for, for the benefit of your safety advice and damien for you know, general industry um, observations uh, about uh, you know clean machines and uh, your your own equipment, and uh, for Michael, who's uh, lucky to be in the north of Sweden, and uh, I hope you uh, enjoy your time there, and, and thank you for your contribution. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, Many thanks uh, to our moderator, Dr. O'Sullivan, all of our panelists, and to everyone who has joined us in the audience today. An on-demand copy of the session will be available on the website, and all sessions are CPT accredited, so you'll receive your certificate for today's webinar uh, within one month um, of today's session. If you have any feedback or further questions, please drop us an email, and we'll come back to you as soon as possible. Our next session of the series is taking place tomorrow at 10.30 a.m., and this is a panel discussion on sustainability circular economy in construction so thanks again to uh, our moderator and panel uh, we hope you all stay safe and uh, we hope to see you for our final sessions of the week uh, tomorrow thanks very much all thank you thank, thank you Bye. goodbye Bye.